studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Bill Murray is here. After working with Chicago's Second City improv troupe, he rose to fame as a member of Saturday Night Live from 1977 to 1980. He left the show for a career in Hollywood that has included such hit films as Caddyshack, Ghostbusters, and Groundhog Day. His latest film, Rushmore, is earning him the best reviews of his career. Here is a trailer from the film. These are the names that define our world. The artists who shaped our minds. The rebels who challenged our views. But of all these legends, there is one that stands above all others. I'm sorry, did someone say my name? <laughs> What's the secret, Max? The secret? I think you just gotta find something you love to do and then do it for the rest of your life. For me, it's going to rush more. Sharp little guy. He's one of the worst students we've got. We're putting you on what we call sudden death academic probation. Could I see some documentation on that, please? Did you invite that kid to your party? Max Fisher. Come on, Dad, there's gonna be girls there. I'd rather die. Put your head out of here. Maybe I'm spending too much of my time starting up clubs and putting on plays. It's time, homie. Kiss me, little one. I should probably be trying harder to score chicks. I like your hat. You're a teacher here, aren't you? Oh, I'm so glad you could come. I want you to meet a friend of mine, Peter Flynn, Max Fisher. Right. Who's this guy? Has it ever crossed your mind that you're far too young for me? I like your nurse's uniform, guy. These are OR scrubs. Oh, are they? I don't know what you see in her. I, I don't think she's right for you. What's that supposed to be? Hello, Herman. How are you, Rosemary? I know about you and the teacher. Does Max know? He's about five foot three, 112 pounds, glasses. You know, you and Herman deserve each other. You're both little children. War does funny things to men. You'll find a pair of safety glasses and some earplugs underneath your seats. Please feel free to use them. What do you think of Max's latest opus? It's good. I must hope it's got a happy ending. Bill Murray's performance has already won him award for Best Supporting Actor from the L.A. Film Critics Association, the New York Film Critics Circle, and the National Society of Film Critics. I am pleased to have him on this broadcast again. Welcome back. Thanks, Charlie. Nice to be now, here. Now, let's talk about a few things before we talk about the movie here. Now, this is, this is the thing that everybody in Hollywood is talking about. Mike Ovitz and CAA prepare for battle. Now, you have seen, does this mean that you might be involved here? I mean, is there news that this might touch you? Well, Robin Williams has left CAA yeah. to go with Obitz. Well, this is all business, you know. It's all business, and it's it's ugly, you know. And this, I don't think most. I think most people get a little nervous when the business is on the page, on, the, on the, the entertainment page. You know, it always makes me nervous. I'd much rather see a story about an artist than a manager or an agent. <laughs> when that's happening. It can't be good for anybody. <laughs> you mean the artist says, if, if, if the agent's getting a lot of attention, something's wrong here. Well, there <laughs> is something wrong about it. You know, it's, um, you know, it's the entertainment pages of the paper. I don't know. It's, it's not that I'm jealous of them getting their attention, but it means that, uh, I mean, they call themselves the Creative Artists Agency. Where's the, I don't see the, creative, the artists being uh, represented creatively here if they're fighting each other all the time. You, know, you want something that gets the entertainment and the art out to the most people possible in the best way possible. And if they're fighting each other and won't work with each other, it's, it's handicapping the artists and it's keeping things out. It's a, it's a form of a repression or something. I don't, I don't like it. Well, the, the fact that Mike Ovitz is coming back into what <clears throat> he doesn't call it the agency business, but he calls it the management business, artist management business, does that mean that everybody's shaking in their boots out in Hollywood because he was such a legend as an agent in creating CAA? Well, uh, People are shaking their boots just because they live in Hollywood. You know, the damn place is crumbling all the time. And they call it shaky town. On the Fear TV is alive and well yeah. in Hollywood. But, uh, you know, he's a, he was a guy who, who really made the agency business. You know, he took it up to another level. He created a, a much more powerful agent. 
And, uh, you know, the studios feared him. I mean, when they use fear in, in movies, you know, articles about movies, I'm like, fear? You know, fear? Where are we? You know, fear? You shouldn't fear anybody. You should be wary of people, but fear, that's, you know. Uh, he, but he's, he has talent, you know. He used to be my agent, and he was a talented guy, and he moved on to be, uh, you know, he, he went from being, you know, wondering about, worrying about the size of my trailer and whether or not I'd, you know, I would, I would uh, you know, get to keep my wardrobe on a film to uh, putting together the uh, Universal deal when the, when the yeah. Japanese bought it, stuff like that. Those kinds of things, and, and then he moved to Disney where he had a, you know, a miserable time, uh, a short time, and, and then he was out of the business, and, you know, now he's back, and, and his old agency's fighting with him. And not that he's the star of it, or anybody should be, but there, you know, then so he's raiding his old company and taking uh, managers from other companies. Well, of course he's going to. He's got a new company, and people go to new companies. And he's They're a competitive happy. animal. He's a competitive guy, and he knows the business. He knows how to do it, and he figures there's a place for him to go in. He's having worked now really on both sides of the desk, having worked at Disney for a while. Yeah. He Why sees isn't it? Tell me this. I mean, it, it seems to me it ought to be perfectly reasonable for an artist, you, to be interested in this because it has to do with uh, a income, access, options, freedom, all those kinds of things for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to make certain kind of movies. Somebody. The more leverage, the more power you have, the more someone knows how to give you that, the better off it is for you. Yeah, it's, I've always been, uh, it's always been a puzzling thing that uh, the sweetest and softest people in Hollywood often have a sidekick that's the ferocious pit bull, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I always wonder, why is he partners with that guy? It used to puzzle me. He's such a nice guy, and that guy's such a rat, you know? <laughs> but it's because that soft person needs to have his space, that he's got a, he has a, you know, a dog, you know? But uh, I'm very, I stayed with the Creative Arts Agency when Ovitz left, and uh, I'm happy with my agents there. They're really good. I've gotten better scripts than I ever got when Ovitz was my agent. You know, I'm getting better yeah. material than I ever got. But Ovitz was, knows some business, so what he proposed, is, he said, well, you know, you could keep your agent and still come and work with us, too. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do that. But now this thing is that the, they won't let you do that. You know, well, and then you start thinking, well, people are pushing me around. You know, that's, I don't like that feeling. I don't like to be bullied. I don't so like it could bullies. have worked really well. You'd have a management from Ovitz and agency from CAA in there because they're fighting with each other. Yeah, That's can't. not possible and you may lose. Right. And you get a crummy feeling in your mouth because people are telling you what you can't do, you know, and it's not, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be affected. You know, I'm a big boy. I, I've worked real hard to, to uh, you know, choose which pumps I want to go over, you know, mm -hmm. to choose the rocky road. You know, and, and what I want to be smooth and work easily for me and to serve what I want to do, I want that way, you know. You know, I don't, nobody likes a whiner, but, you know, nobody likes a bully e either. Did you have any sense that this film and this role could do for you, provided the opportunity <clears throat> that it clearly has shown when you began? Well... Honestly, no, because it's always sort of luck. But it's, the, it's a good question, because about a year ago, uh, I thought to myself, well, I'd made a number of movies in a row, which I thought were good and all had quality to them, but they either, you know, for some reason, they, didn't, they weren't explosive hits. They weren't huge hits. And uh, I kept thinking, well, maybe I should, you know, strap on an a automatic weapon and just get serious about having a hit movie or something, you know? But... <laughs> I, I calmed down and said, you know, I'm just gonna, uh, I, if I just keep doing ones that I like doing, one of them's gonna hit, you know, one of them's gonna hit. Because you can't predict what the, what the critics are gonna say about anything, and you can't really predict how well a movie's gonna be presented and sold, because sometimes a great movie never gets seen until much too late. And many times a bad movie gets seen by everyone, so there's no, you can't always count on that. But I, I just had a funny, I just sort of relaxed and thought, well, I'm just going to keep doing these movies. Like, this is a movie where, you know, I didn't really get paid, you know. I just did it because I thought these guys were good. And um, on the chance that it might work. So, so uh, you know, I just felt, if I just stay calm, I, I got calm and I realized if I just kept doing the ones I liked, one of them would hit, to make it in a nutshell. But I didn't think it would happen. But I knew that this script was really good. I knew these guys were very good. You must have bought into it quickly because there's this great story, and tell me if it's true, that the director wanted to do something having to do with a plane and a flag, blah, 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 some shot that doesn't appear in the movie. 
And the studio or the boss or whoever had control of the money said, no, it'll cost $50,000 or $75,000. We don't need that shot for $75,000. And you said, I'll write a check for that scene because you believe in the director and you're willing to say, if it's important to him, it's important to me, and I'll take it out of my pocket. Well, that's pretty much the story, but uh, it wasn't quite that much money. And it was, <laughs> I don't want people calling me going, hey, he's got that kind of money to throw around? Maybe he'd give me a check. <laughs> yeah, well. But it was, a, they wouldn't give him the money, and he, it was bothering him. And every day he'd be on the phone with them, and we don't want to say the name of the studio. We don't. <laughs> anyway, they're, yes, they're funny do. about money. What's they're, the they're funny about money because they don't have a lot. Yeah. They're the Walt Disney Studio. Yeah. They're funny about <laughs> they don't have a lot of money. Yes. Uh, no. But so I just said, you know, here, you know, I just I did, I did I wrote him a check. I said, here, you just here's the money. You can do the shot. And he was like, can I really do it? I said, yeah, you really can do it. But before you do it, why don't you just call him and say I wrote him a check, and maybe they'll write you the check anyway. You know, but. Uh, <laughs> So they, it turned out he didn't, didn't do it at all. It turned out he didn't do it at all, but he, it released him from the anxiety by having the check, because I said, seriously, take mm. the thing and go. It's not worth being around somebody who's going to be upset mm. about it. No, I, I, I said, you know, if you think it's right, go ahead. I like what you're doing. Go ahead. And we'll make it back sometime. We'll, we'll make it up. It's not that big a deal. It, wasn't, it, was it would have been about 25000 He was nervous to be working with you. You know that. I don't know that. Yeah, that's true. He told read me. it. I mean, everything oh. I read, I believe. <clears throat> well... He fears me, I guess. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it would come up. I mean, he really was wanted to create this working relationship with you and would whisper and talk softly and sort of... Well, he's if, a film if student. If he wanted you to do it over, he wouldn't make a big scene about it. Right. Well, that's, that's good manners. You know, that's tact. And, uh, you know, he, he's learned that from the really great directors operate that way. They don't shout out at you. The, the bozos shout it out. Do it louder and, uh, and, and don't scratch your nose when you do it. All right, roll again. You know, they, they, they yeah. talk like that. But the, the soft guys and the smart ones and the great ones come up and they go, okay. Uh, and they, it's just yeah. a very private thing, you know, and it keeps everybody. I once watched know, Michael, Mike Nichols on a set. I mean, it was just, he was the quietest guy on the set. Mm -hmm. You know, never screaming, never shouting, just sort of walking around looking. Well, there's a lot to look at. It's an amazing thing, a movie set. And there's so many details you can pay attention to that uh, you're, you're never bored. If, you're, if you really like what you do, you're never bored. There's so many things to notice and so many things to pay attention to. You came aboard to do this. You didn't take a big salary. You believed in the script. It's one of those you'd take, and maybe this will be a breakthrough. Uh, you believed in the director. You liked the script. Tell me the story. Well, um, this gal, Jessica Tushinsky, sends me scripts from CAA. That's where she works. And uh, she sent me this script, and she said, it's by the guys who did Bottle Rocket. Well, I... Uh, I don't know Bottle Rocket, but, you know, <coughs> okay. And she said, have you read it yet? <laughs> no. It's been by the guys who, I, I've also FedExed you a, a copy of Bottle Rocket, you know. So I said, okay. Well, um, so I read the script, and I thought it was good. And she said, it's, I said, I like it. And she said, well, have you seen Bottle Rocket? I said, no, no, I haven't looked at it yet. Well, I, I'll FedEx you another copy, because maybe, I said, I, maybe it's down, uh, down on the table. I don't know where it is. I'll FedEx you another. So there's another bottle rocket. Anyway. Yeah. So I said, well, have you got the directors? Um, I want to talk to the guy. Where is he? She gives me his phone number. I call him up and he goes, um, I said, I like the script. He said, well, have you seen, we did, we did another film called Bottle Rocket. I said, I haven't seen it. He says, I'll, I'll FedEx you a copy. <laughs> you now have the world's have largest library. Of, I have four of them now. I have four. I rent them out. <laughs> but uh, I didn't have to see the movie. And uh, it's really foolish because one time I, I did a movie without seeing what the guy had done and I, and I regretted it. But this, what was that? Uh, that one I should just avoid. But that was because that's just. You know, but you always, you always should. But his name what, was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, he, he's dying, and I don't want to. Oh. Yeah, but, so, uh, the uh, but the important or well, he should be dead anyway for what he did. <laughs> but um, uh, the uh, anyway. So I read the script, but the script was so precisely written. I mean, uh, you could tell that this guy knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. And you knew exactly what he wanted to make, exactly how he wanted each scene to go. And I, I've never really seen one that was that precise. I, I looked at it and I went, this is different. This guy knows exactly what he's doing, and I, I'll go with it. Anybody that can write that well, I feel confident in. Does that say that what you're looking for, optimally, is to work with smart people and be people who know what they're doing? 
who are smart and confident and precise about their vision. So when you get on board, you know what you're signing up for. The ones that have been the best for me are usually scripts that are great. I've done movies where I've had to improvise every day, all day, you know, where you just pretty much toss it out and you just, you take this sort of framework and you make up everything as you go. But there have been a couple movies that were so well written that you just walked in and pretty much said what they, what originally was intended by the writer. There was one that a guy named Danny Rubin wrote called Groundhog Day, the original script of which was really a gem, an, an original idea and a masterpiece in its own way. There was another one called Mad Dog and Glory by Richard Price, who's a well-known author and he has a great way with words. And there was this one that Anderson wrote with Owen Wilson. Those are three that came in and I, I brought almost nothing to the movie. You know, if I can look at, usually I look at it and go, and I look at it by how much of it I'd have to fix. Because they're just, they're just sort of vague. They're, you know, I think word processors is part of the problem now. Because people go, well, we need about, uh, this has to be a scene that's about uh, four minutes long. And uh, I got that done. Okay, <laughs> now, and then, so it doesn't matter what they write. There's just an automatic going on and they write. Where would you put Ghostbusters? Well, that's Danny Eckright. He's my friend. Uh, I would say that one... Well, that, uh, that one I committed to after he'd only, he'd only sent me uh, 45 pages of it. That was different. I saw the first 45 pages of that movie and I said, let's go. Because I knew what he had was really great. It was you a really it. great idea. Yeah. We never, I mean, the last third of that movie never got sort of written away. It was lots of explosions, you know. I mean, that's, it becomes an action movie at a certain point. But that, the first 45 pages of that movie were, were, at, were really inspired. There is this story about you, too, that Ghostbusters did so well because mm -hmm. you had been doing movies that were increasingly serving your interest and you were doing better and they were doing better, et cetera, et cetera. Larger roles, better box office. And all of a sudden you get to Ghostbusters and it's like $300 million. It's better than anything you'd ever done. Mm -hmm. And that you had some trepidation after that. And that, that. was when that was a lot of money. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when $300 million today is what? You know, if you don't have a billion, a week. you're yeah. not big time. That you in a sense, looked at the success of Ghostbusters and said, man, I can't top that. Maybe I better take a breather here. Mm -hmm. True? That's true. Yeah. I knew I wouldn't be able to uh, top that, and I knew that, the, uh, that it would be just a little bit more than I could take the sort of intensity of that success. It'd be a little bit too much for me. Mm. So I just uh, packed up and, and uh, moved over to uh, France for, for about six months. And Doing what? Doing nothing. I went to school. I, I took French at the Sorbonne, and uh, uh, I ate a lot. I had a son born there, and just did nothing. Just left show business there, and didn't really talk on the phone much. And you strike went me. To the movie. Actually, what I really did was I went to the movies a lot. I went to school, and I went to the Cinematheque every day. And you only did this for how long? I did it for about six months. I was there about a total of about nine months. Could you have done it, say, for two years? Well, I got tricked. I got, I got tricked to come back and do a movie that I thought was going to be something I wanted to do. And when I got, I was like, well, there's a great one that's going to be great. And I came back to do it. And I was like, this? I came back for this? What was it? It was called uh, Legal Eagles is what it oh, yeah, was called. And it was, it was, that was Robert Redford and yes. Deborah Winger? Yes. <laughs> should I, never, should I had never the come Deborah back. Winger part. And uh, <laughs> I just didn't like it. And so I left. But I, if I had known, I wouldn't have come back. And actually, when you quit work, it takes you twice as long to work. And so if you ever quit work, and if you say, I'm going to take six months off, it will take you a whole year to get back in the swing. To get back, because it's, it's something about disconnecting me, it takes you that much longer to get back. Yeah, but would you recommend taking time off every six years or so? Say, yeah, because some law firms have a policy that if you're there every seven years, you take off six well, months if, or a year. if law firms do it, Charlie, it, <laughs> it probably can't be right. So there's a reason not to do it. Um, but I think if you can take the time off, you know, you should do something. Otherwise, you, you get narrow and you don't have much life experience and you keep grinding yeah. up the same. And your family must have loved junk. it, huh? Yeah. It was nice. There are some people I know who really have it under control in a sense of the kind of life they're the careers where they want it to be. It has options. It may not be perfect, but it has options. They also have found some balance in, in this new word I've learned, proportionality. Mm -hmm. You know that word now? 
They're all used no, in Washington. I'm, I want to learn that you know, one too. This, Let me write that one down. This is a good one because it has to do with making the, cr the punishment fit the crime. Yes. It's the new thing coming out of Washington. Right. No, I got Proportionality. it. Proportionality. Um, you seem to have that. Currently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, uh, you know, you, sometimes your personal life comes in and your life comes in and hits you in the head and says, I'm happening and your, your business doesn't matter anymore. And uh, you have to pay such intense uh, attention to it in order to sort of stabilize that, you know, your business just recedes into the background. And, uh, and you see how much less you can get by with. You don't need to work as much. And I've, I've taken just these sort of art movies, I call them, in the last year or two, and they're, they've been fun. You know, I enjoy it. I get to go work. I come back. I've also got, you know, you know, you know, children, and I've spent a lot more time with my kids than I did, the, you know, at first, you know, and um, it's good, it's valuable. Uh, it's valuable for me because it sort of keeps you okay, and uh, it's valuable for them because, you know, they, they recognize me when I walk in the door, you know. Was, uh, it, was it easy for you when you started out as an entertainer? <clears throat> I mean, did you, were you an instant fish in water? Well, the very beginning, no. The very beginning, no. But once I started getting paid, <laughs> I got really got on a roll. Yeah. Once I started getting paid, I had great luck and great fun. Did, your brother came before you or after? Before me. He was there, so he paved the way. I mean, yes. At Second City. Right. He was a uh, he was a huge help, and it, and you know, I mean, if there's anybody I owe you know, the most to, it's probably, I'm sure it's Brian. Now, was Danny there? Who was there that you later worked with? Uh, Candy was there when I was there. Candy and I started the same week. Yeah. Uh, Belushi was there before yeah. me. He and Brian worked together. Uh, Danny was in Canada, but he came down to Chicago, and I showed him around Chicago. Danny, they opened it, the second city started in Chicago. They opened a theater in Canada, and they sent some Chicagoans up there to open it, and uh, they sent Joe Flaherty, uh, and yeah. Brian to go up there, and it was Gilda up there, and uh, Danny, and Rosemary, and Eugene Levy, and I'm probably forgetting somebody. Mm -hmm. But um, when you look at those clips, like we did <coughs> Saturday Night Live, yeah, yeah. Wait, do, you, do you look and say, "Man, that was good," uh, or do you say, "Sometimes I, I think, can't well, believe I did that." Oh, I, there's ones that are more horrifying than that. <laughs> the ones that don't make it on the reruns are the ones yeah. that, you know, the, those are buried in a vault somewhere. Um, Plus you see the people you work with, some of them who are no longer Well, when I see Gilda, I go, ah, oh, you know, it's just, it still talent. racks me to see her gone. And Belushi, you know, he would have been 50 day before yesterday. 50, not even being 50 is so yeah. funny. He was 33, he never made 34. Uh, I look at it and, uh, it was a it was a great it's like you know catching a touchdown pass or something like that you had a great moment you know you made people laugh at that time and you, you know you're not gonna you know you got a different game playing but it, it, it's fun to watch you know like you had a moment and you happened yeah. to be there where it was happening and it was and, a it was you enjoyed the, the ride and said it was hey. a great job and it was fun and people like it people loved it and it's fun you know you as I like the show that's on now the current cast I think is very good I'm actually going to do it in a couple of weeks. But it's fun for, you know, you still get a kick out of people saying, it's never going to be as good as it was. That was great. <laughs> They're okay now, but it'll never be as good as when it was. When you were there. Ah, now that was that quality. That was good. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at a clip. This is a scene where you are trying to talk Max. Just explain this film to me. Mr. Bloom, your character. Uh, there's this great relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, this kid is like, does everything believes he ought to be on Mount Rushmore. He's on his way to being on Mount Rushmore. And you come along. What's your role? I play a tycoon who graduated from his school. Uh, I'd grown up poor and was a self-made millionaire. And I come back to the school and give a lecture saying, basically speaking to the poor kids in the school, saying, just get the rich kids in your sights and take them down. <laughs> and he fixes on me as his ticket. Like, I, he, all of a sudden, we're... You're his mentor. Yeah, right? I'm the man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I see him as the kid I was when I was there, with all the ambition and just needing a little bit of help, just needing a leg up. And uh, we become friends. I'm amused by him. He's fascinated yeah. by me. 
he falls, he gets a, I don't know where we're, what we're going to look at, but he, he gets a crush on one of the teachers. Well, that's the point we're going to look at. We're going to oh. he try, where you try to talk Max out of falling for the teacher, Miss Cross. Ah, uh, yeah. He crushes on the girl at the school, so I'm going to go check things out for him. And what's going to happen is you're going to crush on her, too. Roll tape. Here it is. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Max, how's it going? Terrible. Tell me something. When you talk to Miss Cross... Do you have a telephone you pass? Excuse me. Do you have a telephone pass? One second. I gotta tell you, I don't know what you see in her. I, I don't think she's right for you. What's that supposed to be? I mean, she's not that beautiful. She's not that intriguing. I mean, she has something that you can't put your finger on, but... Look, Mr. Bloom, your comments are valuable, but let's get to the point. Son. Will she see me again, yes or no? No. Hang on. I'm talking on the telephone. Oh, come on. That's rude. The actor, young actor's name is... Jason Schwartzman. That's, he's in his fencing outfit there. He's the captain. He's... He does everything the, well. Founded the except, except not really. Race. He just founds. Yeah. He's founded the fencing team. He's right. not a great fencer. He's right. not. He's not a great beekeeper. But he's founded the Rushmore Beekeeper. Beekeepers <laughs> Club. Yeah. So what's his skill? His skill is uh, he just is enthusiastic. He has absolutely no skill. He's enthusiastic and he's irrepressible. Yeah. So he thinks he'll get Miss Cross. He thinks he'll be on Mount Rushmore. He thinks everything is going to work out for him. When he finds out Miss Cross likes fish, he talks me into funding an aquarium for the school. <laughs> right. and, and what's interesting about this is the relationship between Mr. Bloom and Max is more friendship. It's not, I mean, in fact, you are as admiring of him as he is of you mm -hmm. because he has these, he wants to fix things. Well, he's what I was, you know. He's yeah. that, he has that ambition, he has that idealism, he has that feeling that he's just gonna bust through any second now, you know, and I have a guy, I'm a guy who's made a lot of money in pipe, you know, in steel pipe. I'm unhappily married, I got two kids I don't like, you know, yeah. and uh, I like this kid, I wish this kid were my kid, and I wish, you know, I wish I were guiding him, I wish he were my heir, you know. It's a really interesting movie, it's good, it's got a lot going on. It's fun, this guy. Are you, so you're not surprised at all the attention and how well the word of mouth is, and the fact that you have received, as I mentioned in the introduction, these nominations for Best Supporting Act. Well, when I finally saw the movie, in a sort of a rough cut, I went, boy, this has got some great moves in it. This is really great good. Great moves. Moves, yeah. Meaning? Well, <clears throat> the way stories get told in pictures, you know. I mean, the writing and, and writing, it's a two-language medium. It's, story, it's words and pictures. So you write a script, but the way you shoot it, too, shows how much how you want to impact things on an audience. And these guys have an enormous film culture. Like, they're, they're, they're ripping off uh, Apocalypse Now and Barry Lyndon and all, the, all these films right. of your right. whole life, but they're using them for completely different purposes than Kubrick may have used them for, you know? Yeah. They're using it to set it. I, mean, I remember Wes saying, oh, I said, what's this shot we got? He goes, oh, it's one I saw in Barry Lyndon. It's one, you know, <laughs> no. you remember Barry Lyndon? It was yeah, just right. an enormous thing. No, no. And the, no. ours, though, is is the intermission of the, of, of the school play. And it's the Barry Lyndon shot, but it's coming past a lot of, you know, mothers and fathers going, oh, yeah, talk, gathering, and all the way out past people buying Cokes and drinks yeah. and coming out to this angst-filled couple, myself and Olivia Williams, talking I, about Max's play. I mean, I talk to a lot of those guys who come in here, these young directors who some of them between the ages of 25 and 35. Mm -hmm. And you, they're just like that. They're inside, they know everything. They've seen every movie. I mean, they're, they're more students of cinema mm -hmm. than most. You know? Well, that can be good and bad, but I just think this guy... Bad is, if they're copying or bad if... Well, you have to... If it's... If it's... Um, you know, it always gets perverted when people say, oh, the good ones copy, the great ones steal. Well, you know, that sort of sends a misdirection to somebody. Yeah, but, uh, you know, people take that one incorrectly. But you've got to see what it is and say, oh, okay, it's about the impact, you know, of, of the way the camera moves. It's about how it, you end up with this picture. The words are already in the language. We already have the language, and the photographs are, are in the language. The camera moves are in the language, you know. So you can be very studious about it. It's like the French. 
Let's get right down to it. It's like the French. You know, yes. they can't play rock and roll to save their lives. <laughs> they can't play the blues to save their, save their lives. But if you say, if you play a song by somebody, you know, Sunhouse, they go, that's Sunhouse, the famous uh, musician, the blues player. That is from the session he did in Meridian, Mississippi. <laughs> yes. I believe that is the January 24th. I'm doing a French-Canadian accent for no reason. But they're, you know, true. they'll know the date, the time, they know and the everything, take. But cannot of it, produce. But they couldn't an give artist. you the, an ounce of the feeling of it, you know. Yeah. But a guy, this guy Wes has got, and there. So it's the difference, you know, mind and body, and so hopefully a little bit more. But so you know, he just. He just knows how to get these things together in one place. Uh, one more clip before we go. Uh, this is a clip in which you tell Dirk uh, that you don't want Max to know about the affair between you and Ms. Crawford. This is a wonderful actor. This kid's name is Mason Gamble. He, he's been like, I think he played like Richie Rich or Dennis the Menace or something like that. But this kid is really, really a good actor. Roll tape. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, you're welcome. Pleasure thank to have you. you on the program. It's nice to watch your show. Nice to be on your show, too. Thank you. Uh, you're going to go play in Pebble Beach. Yep. How well will you do? I predict victory. I expect <laughs> victory this time, Charlie. Uh, Hopefully, though, it's been very dry out there. And last year, we were in it. We were in it. We were going to win it. Yeah. And it rained real hard. And since it was already wet, wet yeah, that's it That's what they all say, though. They all say that. Who? Well, Tell me who. Give me the names. Jack Lemon says that. Come on. But this year it's been real dry, so if it rains, it'll just be wet, and I'm a mutter. Now, do you always play with the same partner? <clears throat> Scott Simpson. Oh, Scott Simpson. Mm -hmm. How would you like to be playing with David Duvall? Uh, in a money match, I think it'd be great fun. <laughs> he's really playing great. Can you believe a 59? Yeah. It's even worse than that, though. I think he's won the last four times he's shown up. Something crazy like that. He's, oh, man. He's, uh, he's, he's playing very high level right now. Really high. And, <laughs> say the least. And enjoying himself, too, I hope. Thank you. So are you. Yeah. Bill Murray, back in a moment. Stay with us. <laughs> Director Wes Anderson is here. He first came to our attention in 1996 with his critically acclaimed debut film, Bottle Rocket. The chairman of Walt Disney Pictures, Joe Roth, was such a fan of the movie, he made sure Wes Anderson made his next film for Disney. That film is Rushmore. It is generating a great deal of buzz surrounding its February 5th release. The film focuses around the life of a prep school misfit and his efforts to win over a teacher. I am pleased to have Wes Anderson here to talk about this film. Well, Thank you very uh, much. What's interesting about Rushmore uh, is, is that for me, it is sort of come out of nowhere to, to sort of have this buzz about it. Uh, why is that? Well, the other movie we made, um, almost no one saw. So I think that contributes to the out of nowhere. Right. Didn't, it, it didn't explode at the box office. No, it was released very, very quietly. And um, it sort of built up a little cult following eventually. But, yeah. um, but it had a few fans that were in the movie business, like Roth, who kind of set us up uh, with Disney. Um, and then the other thing, the movie doesn't have a lot of stars. It's got Bill Murray, who's playing a supporting role, but most of the other people are sort of new faces. Um, so I think it was kind of a surprise to some people. Your lead was, I mean, you looked a long time to find somebody, and then this guy just walks in and you say, what? magic. Yeah, right. We, had, we, we looked for a year trying to cast this part, because it was the kind of thing where the whole movie is riding on the shoulders of this kid. Uh, you know, it's a the character's 15 years old. And... Um, and we had looked all over America. We looked in Canada. We had casting directors. I went through, went through four rounds of casting directors in L.A. and I had them all over the place. Yeah. And at one point, we were even looking in England, even though the character is American, because we were thinking that he would be, we were thinking like it could be a kid doing a fake English accent, which would actually be a real English accent because we'd be using an English actor. And we were desperate. We were just coming up with really bizarre ideas. Um, and then finally, this kid, Jason Schwartzman, uh, walked in. And I just knew within about three minutes that we could actually make the movie, that we weren't going to have to well, shut down. What did down he have that made you so euphoric? Well, I think the main things were, the first thing is, I mean, I've done, the other movie we did is almost all with unknown, or people who just weren't actors, non-actors. And so I'd kind of experienced, had some experience with casting those kind of, you know, people. And it's a thing where as soon as they start playing a scene, you can tell if they can be real or not. Yeah. Some you know, they can either do it or not. And then beyond that, it was that, this, and he was very real. And then the other thing was he just had a real instant intelligence and energy and sort of a force. 
which was going to be very important because the character does some awful things, and I still want us to be with him and pulling for him, you know, and it needed someone who would kind of, you know, bring the audience along and they would stay with them. Um, so. Was Murray an easy sale? Um, Murray was... But what you're happened? not paying him big bucks. No, we couldn't pay him. That's, we, we wrote it for him, and, but we thought we weren't going to get him because we thought we couldn't afford him. We thought we wouldn't be able to get to him, get him to read it or any of that kind of stuff. And um, what ended up happening was his agents knew the script and his agents were fans, so they put it in front of him and we had a couple other mutual friends who kind of promoted us to him. Yeah. And so then what happened was a week after we gave it to him, he called me and... Um, and he took call me, you know, he sort of said hello, and then he started talking about this Kurosawa movie called Redbeard, right. um, which is about a doctor. And we spoke for about an hour about uh, Redbeard, which I had no idea what it had to do with anything that uh, we were discussing. And at the end of it, he said, yeah, I think I'll do, uh, I'll do Rushmore with you, yeah. And you don't quite know why he said it. You just knew that he had had an opportunity to talk about yeah, Kurosawa. He wanted he wanted to talk about Redbeard at that moment. So <laughs> you'd seen said. Redbeard. I I hadn't seen. Redbeard. You hadn't seen it. He was telling me I needed to see it, oh, and then I he see. took me on a tour of Redbeard, and yeah. then I saw it, and then I still don't get it. Really, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> have you told him you don't get it and you don't quite understand it? And what's I think, the problem here? I think I, ju I think I just did. You did. <laughs> I think you did too. Uh, roll tape. This is Murray on this program tonight talking about you. He was nervous to be working with you. You know that. I don't know that. That's true. He told read me. it. I mean, everything I read, I believe. <clears throat> well, he fears me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it would come up. I mean, he really was wanted to create this working relationship with you and would whisper and talk softly and sort of... Well, he's if, a film if student. If he wanted you to do it over, he wouldn't make a big scene about it. Right. Well, that's, that's good manners. You know, that's tact. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he's learned that from... The really great directors operate that way. They don't shout out at you. The, the bozos shout it out. Do it louder and, uh, and and don't scratch your nose when you do it. All right, roll again. You know they they, they yeah. talk like that. But the the soft guys and the smart ones and the great ones come up and they go, okay. Uh, and they it's just yeah. very private thing. So I read the script, but the script was so precisely written. I mean, uh, you could tell that this guy knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. You knew exactly what he wanted to make. Exactly how he wanted each scene to go, and. Uh, I've never really seen one that was that precise. I, I looked at it and I went, this is different. This guy knows exactly what he's doing, and I, I'll go with it. Anybody that can write that well, I feel confident in. Were you, were, were you intimidated by him? I, well, I was, before I met him, I was a little terrified. Terrified? Yeah, because I'd heard stories about him, about, you know, if, at first you know that he's a guy who can walk uh, into a crowd of people and take control of it in a way that I never could, you know, he's, he's, he's really funny, he's, everyone loves him already, and, um, and he's big, and everything. Um, and, um, and then I'd also heard about, you know, him throwing someone in a lake on one thing, and I'd heard, you know, that he could, you know, if he, if he didn't like the situation, he's, you know, he's gonna could fix it in his way, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was scared before I met him, as soon as I met him, I felt so comfortable with him, I felt he was so, he was, he was so intelligent, and he was so clearly getting involved with us for all the right reasons, and he wanted and he wanted to do what we wanted to do. And then I just realized everything that I was afraid of, I can use all that stuff. He's going to bring that to to this, and you know, and we can benefit from it. Is directing hard? I, you know, it's there. It's it, if you're a shy person, I think there are parts of it where you're gonna, where it's a little scary. I mean, like I'm not a very um, I'm not necessarily that outgoing in general, and you've got to be when you're doing a movie. You know, you've got all these people, but it's such a nice feeling when you get this group together and you're all kind of working on the same thing together. And most of it is, I mean, it's a nice. The other good feeling is that when when we're doing a movie, I happen to know that I'm the one who does have all the answers to every question they're going to ask because I prepared all this stuff and I know the script better and I've worked on it all this time and I have ideas for how I want it to be. Um, so I f can take just an automatic confidence knowing that I, that I have the right answers. Um, but it's important things. that you have the right answers and it's important that they at least think you do. That's true. That's true. And I think a lot, and also, you know, the people like, like the movie, we, the first movie did Bottle Rocket, I used all the same crew from Bottle Rocket. Um, you know, all the same department heads, the cameraman and the production designer and the editor and all those people. So they know me and they've worked with me. So the new people who come on sort of look to them and see the way they look at the, to me 
And that can kind of help set the tone of things also. Because what I want it to be is everyone feeling like they're, I don't, I, it's not going to work. It's like an authoritarian kind of thing, because that's just not my style. That's not really who I am. I don't think I could carry that so off So what's at all. the hardest thing? The hardest, well, the, the, the scariest thing with this one was that I was putting together, with the other movie we did, the cast was all a group of friends, and we, the movie sort of was, the movie came together because we were a group of mm. people who wanted to do a movie. With this one, I had to assemble a cast of people, and there were, there were some of them were very experienced actors like Bill Murray and uh, Seymour Cassell, who's in it, and this English actor, Brian Cox, and then some of them were newcomers. But I wanted it to be a group of people who would come together and become friends. It's a movie that's sort of about friendship, and I wanted that kind of feeling on the set. And I, and so, and I was worried about how that would happen, how they would interact. And it came together very nicely. Um, but it was the thing that caused me the most anxiety, I think. You, University of Texas? Yeah. You make a student film, so to speak, what, an 18 minute short. Mm hmm. What we effectively, what we affectionately call battle rockets around here, which you call bottle <laughs> rockets, so we'll give you the benefit of the doubt that it is in fact bottle rocket. Uh, you made 18 minutes and you showed it to somebody, and, and I guess it was Jim Brooks who saw it at Sundance or somewhere and said. Yeah, well, what actually happened was we had the movie, we took it to Sundance, and nothing happened at Sundance. Then this producer, Polly Platt, who worked for Jim Brooks, right. um, she saw it, and she saw a tape of it in our script. She brought it to Jim. And Jim saw it, and nobody wanted to have anything to do with this. And Jim saw it and read it, and it's, and it's always a, a shock to me when somebody can just look at something and they don't care about what, I mean, so much of stuff in the movie business is people reacting to what other people want, you know, yeah. what, bidding wars and all that stuff. And this was one guy, the only guy once, that's saying, we're going to do this. And that's the same with Bill. You know, Bill just read this script cold, and he made all his own decisions about it. Um, and, you know, when Brooks and Polly Platt uh, got involved, that sort of just set us up to, to, to work in the movies. You know what else is going to happen, too? And I'm sure this must have happened at some point. Somebody, you can do something, and somebody can get it. And they can see something that they know is really good. And while they know, somebody might come in the room and say, that is the worst 18 minutes I've ever seen. And they're saying, yeah, yeah, I understand what's wrong with the film. But did you see this? And anybody who can do this has a real gift. And we can take that and grow it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh... This is a clip called Can't Do It, Max. Um, tell me a little bit about Max, because he's an interesting character. Well, Max is this kid who, um, this was like the center of the movie for us. The reason we wrote the movie was because we came up with this character, uh, me and my co-writer, Owen Wilson. Yeah. Um, and he is this kid who, um, he runs everything in this school. He goes to a prep school called Rushmore. He, he, he's founded all these clubs and societies, kind of runs everything. He puts on, a big part of it is he puts on these big, giant plays. Like, he's done an adaptation of... Serpico that he's putting on these, uh, he's done like a big Vietnam play, these things are like very influenced by TV and movies. And, um, he's, but he's also a horrible student, he's on the verge of getting kicked out, and, um, and he's on scholarship, which he lies about and tells people his father's a neurosurgeon. Yeah, and he's also applying to Oxford with Harvard as a fallback, safety. as a yeah. safety fallback. Right, right. How much of this in your head is you? I, 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 I don't really think of it that way. I mean, I think... There are parallels. There are parallels, yeah. I mean, uh, for me and Owen, my co-writer, both. The stuff we draw, like, the school where we filmed is my school, and the plays that he puts your, on... Your school in Houston. Yes, my school in Houston. That's where we shot it. Um, and, um, and the plays that he puts on are sort of inspired by some plays I put on when I was very young. But other than that, it's, some, it's more like, I think, if I had seen this movie when I was 15 years old, I would have, that would have been my movie. That would have been the, the I would have, it would have changed me. Yeah. Um, it would have been, a, it, because I think it's like a role model for, it's like a kid who, it shows you a way to be heroic and still be a horrible student and get rejected from all your schools and fail in all kinds of ways, but succeed in other ways. And I didn't really have an idea of how to kind of put, do that. And I was going to get rejected and I was going to do terribly, so. Roll tape. Here's a scene called, uh, between Max and uh, Brian Cox, Dr. Guggenheim. We're putting you on what we call sudden death academic probation. And what does that entail? It entails that if you fail another class, you'll be asked to leave Rushmore. In other words, I'll be expelled. That's correct. Could I see some documentation on that, please? Too many extracurricular activities, Max. Not enough studying. 54, 42, 41. Mm -hmm. Dr. Guggenheim. 
I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but the fact is, no matter how hard I try, I still might flunk another class. If that means I have to stay on for a postgraduate year, then so be it. But we don't offer a postgraduate year. Well, we don't offer it yet. Just bring up the grades. You remember how I got into this school? Yes. You wrote a play. That's right. Second grade. A little one act about Watergate. And my mother read it and felt I should go to Rushmore. And you read it and you gave me a scholarship, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Do you regret it? No, I don't regret it. But I still might have to expel you. And explain this to me. I mean, he seems like the way he talks is a smart kid. Right. Yeah, he but is he's failing. A, he's a smart kid. I think he's deeply disturbed in, in a lot of ways. And he's also probably one of those kids who's very verbal, but he probably will never be able to do math, you know? <laughs> he's one of those kind of people. Uh, this relationship between you and Owen Wilson, what's this collaboration about? I mean, you seem to be joined at the hip. Yeah, well, I, Owen and I have been friends for about 10 years, and uh, we went to school together, and all our whole sort of... The, however long we've been working and doing movies and everything, it's been together. Um, and I just sort of feel like there's nobody else. That I, I know my work is going to be better if I'm writing with him, and there's, I've never met anybody who else who I would want to write with. And I feel like our sort of sensibility and our sense of humor is so similar. The things that we're attracted to in characters and stories and behavior and things are just so close um, that I just it just seems like, you know... I just been lucky. I feel I'm lucky. You know, I'm lucky to have it. Oh. All right. Oh, just one more time. Take a look at oh, one other clip from this film called "Want Me to Grab a Dictionary." This is the infamous in this movie, Miss Cross, who Max has his eye on, and so does uh, Bill Mary's character. Take a look. Max. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you something? Sure. Has it ever crossed your mind that you're far too young for me? It crossed my mind that you might consider that a possibility, yeah? Quite apart from the fact that if you're a student... I'm not trying to pressure you into anything, Miss Cross. But I'm surprised you brought it up so bluntly. I just want to make sure... We've become friends, haven't we? Yes. Good. And, um... The, the truth is, neither one of us had the slightest idea where this relationship is going. We can't predict the future. We don't have a relationship, Max. But we're friends. Yes, and that's all we're going to be. That's all I meant by relationship. You want me to grab a dictionary? You and Wilson write this together. How did the collaboration work in terms of the process of writing? Well, the way we, the way we usually work is we start out just talking. And um, usually we're traveling or something like that, and we're talking and talking and talking about the characters and telling stories you know, we both have a hundred stories that we know of each other, you know, and then we have stories of things that happened to us together, people that we've kind of watched, and that stuff all starts to kind of mix together and we talk, and then we start just writing on little scraps of paper, which we trade back and forth, and I'll write something out, and then I'll get it back from home, and I'll have big X's through it, and uh, things scribbled, and, uh, and we rewrite each other's stuff, and, um, and then eventually I start typing it. Um, the, the bad thing is, when I, like, if Owen gives me something and I type it, if I don't like part of it, I just... I just don't type it, I just erase it. But if I give Owen something, he just puts an X through it, which is so much more, so much more aggressive and seems so much ruder than just erasing is it. The, are these defining personality traits? Uh, the defining personality trait is that I have learned to type and he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> you have to write your own scripts? I mean, so far, everything you've made, you've written. Yeah. It's two. Right, it's two. <laughs> but, so, uh, it, it, I, I mean, it feel, I, I, I haven't read anything that felt, I mean, these, these are pretty personal movies. Like, this movie, Rushmore, is very personal to me and Owen. It's, what does that mean, personal? It's got enough, it's got so many little things that connect to our own lives, you know. The characters come so much from people that we've known and, um, and from little aspects of ourselves. And the setting is so familiar to us. They're, they're, and, they're, and then there's sort of thematic stuff that's personal to us. And I just don't think there's any way that I would find a script that would mean as much to me. You say thematic stuff that's personal to us, what do you mean? I mean like the kid in the, the kid that the movie's about is someone who he doesn't try, you know, like in high school one of the central things is to be cool. 
Yeah. And this is a kid who's not cool at all, but who is, uh, who, uh, but who is, um, he has his own ideas of the way he wants to be, things he wants to kind of accomplish. And he has this great enthusiasm for those things and this kind of drive about it and a resilience. And, and I sort of kind of, that, that's something that means something to us. I mean, I like people who are, who are kind of unusual characters and kind of originals. And, um, Do we think Max is going to be successful in life? I think he's like headed for Broadway or something, you know? <laughs> Do he's going to like hook up with Mike Nichols or somebody like yeah. that. He'll become a protege of someone and he'll... And he'll yeah. you know. Speaking of Mike Nichols, uh, he's a hero. Yeah. Because? Well, I, you know, I, I've loved uh, a number of his, uh, you know, I've, I've loved lots of his movies. And, and some, somehow, The Graduate is a movie that Owen and I have gotten into our consciousness in a way where whenever we write a script, we end up feeling like we just stole a hundred things from The Graduate and we can't point out what they are. But we feel like there's like so, some sort of tonal thing or something. It's just like, uh, it just seems to be a part of it. And then there is stuff that I have over, over, overtly stolen also. Overtly? Yeah. yeah. What's the best example of that? Well, there's a scene where Bill Murray is having this, his, uh, his twin sons, who he despises, are having a, it's their birthday party. In the middle of the birthday party, he climbs up on the high dive and does a cannonball into the swimming pool. And he stays underwater by himself. And there's just sort of a lonely moment of him all by himself in the, in the swimming pool, which is, you know, there's a scene in The Graduate where Dustin Hoffman is in, they, his parents give him a wetsuit, a uh, scuba diving thing, and he's just by himself at the bottom of the pool, and it's, that's what's wrong. Uh, who else? Anybody else in your pantheon of heroes that are directors that sort of make this? Yeah, uh, a lot. I mean, a guy who I keep thinking about is, is Polanski, who... Uh, Roman Polanski? Roman Polanski. Because of what film? A lot of it is because of Rosemary's Baby and the way he shot it, um, because it's a movie where it's a, it's a horror movie, but the, the performances are all totally real, and there's this, and it's also sort of a comedy, and there's a sort of strange. It's just a little off from reality. You know, the behavior is all real, but there's something about everything in the movie that feels like just a little off, which is kind of setting you up for the fact that eventually it's going to be, it's going to go crazy. I thank you very much, Wes. Thank Pleasure. you, Charlie. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. Cisco Systems, the company that brought the internet to business, is pleased to help bring The Charlie Rose Show to PBS. Cisco Systems, empowering the internet generation. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders. And by Bloomberg, a provider of multimedia news and information services worldwide.